lights right there. So hey, good afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm Dave Isles, and I am with Mellanox Technologies. And I'm uh, responsible for our Ethernet switch business as it relates to open networking. So that means I work with guys like Cumulus. I work with guys like Microsoft with Sonic. I work with Appstra as they do things with Sonic. And I also work with uh, our own uh, native Linux um, switch driver called SwitchDev. And I'm here to talk about this trend towards edge computing and how the networking form factors are going to be changing uh, going forward. So if you were to kind of look, it's no surprise, workloads are, are shifting, right? Workloads are moving from on-premise uh, to the public cloud, they're moving to uh, edge, they're moving to co-location, because it's uh, economically attractive. It is, it's irresistible in many cases to move things in that way. And so what that's caused though is a big growth in what's called white box switches. So just like servers, People are going to the people that make the servers for the people that put their brand names on servers. White box switches have, have grown uh, a great deal. And at Mellanox, we love this because usually that means you are comparing hardware versus hardware. And we compare very favorably there. But one thing that's happened for white box for public cloud is that um, the reason why it's so attractive is it's usually the right price, has the right port count, and you have your choice of the right kind of operating systems for that. So that's what the kind of switches that are in public cloud are different. However, you'll find that most of the white box switches have a bit of a compromise, meaning they're built with off the shelf kind of merchant silicon that was designed many years ago. And so they usually lack scale, they lack uh, VXLAN functionality. Like for instance, you can usually get VXLAN routing uh, as long as you don't need 100 gigabit. But if you want 100 gigabit, you can't get VXLAN routing unless you're willing to do some weird funky loopback cable. VXLAN scale, the number of tunnels, or, or if you want Rocky, and I know some of you guys are going like, what, what is Rocky? So Rocky is an important feature for like machine learning uh, or for uh, high speed storage. So if people are doing NVMe fabrics, it requires Rocky, and all of these things are coming to a data center near you. So that's why it's important to have these things in here. But I bring this up because the form factors for public cloud are changing, right? So if you look, the first guys to do high density 40 gigabit switches, were the guys at Azure and Google and, and guys like that. They were doing it way before the enterprise was doing that. And if you look at 100 gigabit, that was the same thing. So now these are the guys that are going to be pushing for 400 gigabit optics, 400 gigabit connectivity. They're also the guys that are going to want Kobo, so onboard optics, because as they build data centers, they know the connectivity that they need between racks and between leafs and spine. So they may not need to pay the overhead for uh, pluggable optics. You also see them asking for uh, exotic power supplies, and you look for a lot more VXLAN scale. I point this out because today, most switches look the same, whether it's in an enterprise or public data center. That's going to change in, in, in very few, short time. And I bring up that, the scale of tunnels up because VXLAN is now the, like, the tunneling technology of choice for moving workloads between on-premise and public cloud and co-location. So VXLAN is the tunneling for that, but it's also got new use cases. So you'll find that what a lot of people do is it, if they have a public cloud, they're starting to use VXLAN at the edge of their data center, tunnel through their data center, right to a bare metal server, or right to a virtual machine. And what that means is you now have thousands, millions of VXLAN tunnels. And they're doing this because they don't want to have a VRF for every single customer, because they end up having their IP tables explode when they do that. So we're seeing this, and this is a demo that we have that we worked with Microsoft on. So if you go to the Microsoft booth, you would see this demo where they're, they're offloading hundreds of thousands of flows to uh, hardware. Some of 100,000 flows to a single switch. So we have that ability in our hardware, and it's being exposed with some neat things with P4. And so you could see it at the Mellanox booth, uh, which is booth A1, or you can see it at the Microsoft booth. So if that's something you're interested in, please come by and take a look. But I want to get back to this whole diverging form factors. So I mentioned that a lot of workloads are moving to the public cloud, but not all workloads are going to the public cloud. A lot of people are wanting to have their own data, their own servers, and their own infrastructure. And sometimes that's for legal reasons, sometimes it's just uh, uh, how they prefer doing it. And so we see this rise in a technology called hyper-converged infrastructure. And now Oxford's uh, dictionary might define the uh, hyper-converged infrastructure is having compute and storage on the same exact server nodes. And while that's true, that's what hyper-converged infrastructure means, most people buying it are buying it not for that. They're buying it because they get an Amazon Web Services-like experience with the hardware that's in their own basement. 
So they want a cloud in a box, but they want that cloud in their own basement. And so the form factor for those servers is a little different than the public cloud. So in the military, they have this acronym called size, weight, and power, or SWAP. And if you look at the SWAP for servers for hyperconverged infrastructure, they're very common to have two U platforms with four nodes in them. And it doesn't matter which brand you get, that is the common building block. That's the brick that people build these things at. And that's the server swap. And if you look at the networking that's needed for most hyperconverged solutions, they don't need a 48 port switch, right? Which is the common switch. They don't need a 24 port switch. In fact, most times they don't even need a 12 port switch. They need like six or eight ports. And so the type of switch that most people need for hyperconverged are smaller. You know, so we make these little half width switches that are still one U, they still go in server racks. But the idea is that just by changing cables, you might want to go from 10 gig to 25 gig or to 50 gig or 100 gig. No licenses, just change cables. And that's another important attribute of hyperconverged. A lot of these guys, they start small. They may have two or four rack units that are um, used for hyperconverged. And one of the beauties is if I need more scale, I just add more bricks to them and it scales seamlessly. I no longer have to say, if I want something this big, and if I need it a little bit bigger now, I need to go to something twice as big. They get to scale with time. So people want the networking to scale the same way, that says, listen, I may start with a 16 port switch, and then change cables, and now it's a 64 port switch. I mean, we'll go from one rack to two racks to three racks. So having something that pay as you go is pretty important in hyper-converged. It's good for on-premise, maybe not as important in the big public cloud. The other thing, so I promised to talk about edge computing. So edge computing is this kind of opposite of what happened 10 years ago. So 10 years, years ago, everybody was talking about data center consolidation, right? Everybody had 20 little data centers and they were like, nope, I want to get down to two. You know, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. But that's kind of gone in the, the, the old way of doing things. As people have recognized, actually maybe they don't want to do much of their own infrastructure. They want to put things in colo sites. They want to put things in public cloud because the economics, again, are, are uh, very attractive. What that also then means that you get to push things closer to your clients, and that's important. So if you look at the projections for edge computing, there's going to be 50 billion devices connected to the internet in just a couple years, 50 billion. And what IDC says is half of that data is going to be processed at the network edge. And so why is that? Why not just process everything in, in one big data center? The same question could be applied. What's driving the growth of edge computing? So part of it is the economics of those micro, the, the, the colo sites. But a big part of it is the speed of light. So how long it takes for the light to get around the planet to get back to your mobile app affects how enjoyable that mobile app might be. People are playing with virtual reality headsets. That, that time lag can make something playable or not playable. So people are pushing content as close and compute resources as close to people that are using it. Another example is NFL stadiums. So NFL started putting Wi-Fi everywhere. And now what they're doing is they're putting content, they're putting data centers in those stadiums because they want to provide content to their, that's local to their, um, their customers. The other thing you'll see is self-driving cars. So self-driving cars are amazing data collectors, right? They have radar, they have LIDAR. If they went through puddles, they might have sonar, right? They're going to have lots of data collection all day long. And at night, when you park it in the garage, they aren't just updating their firmware, they're sending information back to the home office. And that home office actually is probably pretty, pretty close to wherever that car is. Because what a lot of these self-driving car manufacturers are doing is saying, we're going to put a data center in the same metro area as the car. Because as it turns out, the driving behaviors of other drivers, the pedestrians, how they dr walk, is going to be different in the Pacific Northwest. The weather is different. Even traffic conditions, like you know, right on a red, is not a common thing in every state. So what we do see is this, this need for data to be close to your, um, uh, the, the clients. And so there's this term, micro data center. And all it means is it's a small data center. What it means is sometimes we're talking about a, a cloud in a box. It's a, it's a cell tower. It's a cloud in a truck, because it's in transportation. It's in um, what used to be a central office is now a, um, a data center. And one common thing that we see out there is a need for low power consumption, which means it's harder to cool, but it also means that you need zero touch provisioning, because you don't want to do a truck roll anytime you change something. And let's face it, most of these little data centers, they don't have people there. So you have to like, account for that. So those are unique requirements that are different than the rest of the world. 
And so the type of switches that you'll see for these edge is going to be very different again. In fact, it's going to separate from what you see on premise. In fact, in many cases, if you look at CDN, CDN used to be you'd have a rack of 48 servers and they're all 1U and you would aggregate through some very expensive, uh, you know, big router. So the big fat router now is being replaced in many cases by saying instead of having 48 1U servers, I might have three or four what we call fat nodes. So fat nodes are like, you know, bigger, faster servers that might have a single 100 gig link on it. So what they're doing is they're taking some CDN guys, they're saying, listen, instead of having tons of servers, I'm gonna have three servers in a pop. And instead of having a bunch of 48 port switches, I'm gonna have, I need three 100 gig ports and a handful of 10 gig ports. So they turn the switch upside down and say the 10 gig ports are going to my ISPs. I may have a bunch of ISPs I'm serving content to. So this edge computing is very different in terms of the servers. So you'll find that uh, some of the server manufacturers have a swap for the servers and they're making edge computing servers. So at Mellanox, we make edge computing networking, just like we make HCI optimized networking and cloud optimized networking. So you just see that they're, they're, they're spreading. Now I will say, they're not everything spreading. One of the things we see as a common need across the industry is the need for telemetry. And we have this saying in networking that says, listen, the smarter our customer is, the smaller his config file. And those of you guys that have been in the business are probably nodding your heads because you know the opposite's true. The guy that has problems every other day is the guy that has uh, every feature turned on and every proprietary uh, solution out there in his data center. That means you have now exposed a larger plane for problems to exist. And so what we see is the smarter guys are, are, are putting smaller and smaller number of protocols. We have some guys that say they want three protocols. They want BGP, BFD, and LLDP. Now the exception of that is telemetry. People want more visibility into what's going on. And so we have, again, a great demo at our booth that uh, works with Appstra. So Appstra has a couple of demos, one with working showing Sonic provision kind of on a data center wide um, tool, but they also have good telemetry features that they're seeing with Cumulus. And so with Cumulus, there's a demo with Appstra, and what they're doing is showing real low level telemetry and how you can get to the bottom of kind of root cause analysis very quickly if you've got the right tools. And so when I look at the right tools, what I'm talking about is it used to be very commonplace where people would pull their stats on their switches every five minutes. And then I got every one minute. And now I just hear people saying, hey, every second I want to get this information. The problem is that in one second, our switch can transmit 4.7 billion packets. And if I've got a thousand of those switches, I've got trillions of packets. That one second, I had a lifetime of activities. I had wars that, that were fought in packets that microburst events happen. And all I now see is an average of that. And so instead we say, hey, listen, there's a big data tool called histograms, and our switches can monitor the, the packets for you or the counters for you, not a thousand times a second, but hundreds of thousands of times per second. The problem is how do you look at that data? And if you're a big data guy, you're like, oh yeah, histograms, this is the best thing ever. I know exactly what to do with that. But most of you guys hear histograms and your eyes roll back in your head and you go, I don't know what to do. However, I'll tell you what, if you shop online, chances are you already use histograms. Right, you go to buy something, you see something has 6,000 reviews, you don't read every review, right? What do you do? You pull down the histogram and you go, hey, look over here, I've got a grouping of one stars. I look at those people, are they like me? Are they gonna, is this something that I care about? So histograms are just a tool for you to kind of look at a lot of data and quickly figure out, does this matter or does it not matter? And so that's something that's in our switches today, it's been in them for a few years, and you'll see from many of our competitors will be offering histograms as a common feature that's needed. So I'm gonna wrap up here. One other new thing that's coming before they give me the hook is that um, telemetry is moving in band. So it used to be everything was out of band. I collect all this data. But wouldn't it be cool is if as a packet moved through my network from hop to hop, each hop put data into that packet that told me what happened along its path. That said, hey look, it took this long to get from this port to that port. Or it took this long to get from one area to another area. Or what was the packet rate? What was the, the packet loss? All right, give me some detail on the queue depths. Anyway, so these are things that we're investing in. Uh, we, we're, we actually can demonstrate some of it on our current hardware, but it's where the industry's going. And so with that, I'm uh, out of time, but my name's Dave Isles, and I represent uh, Mellanox Technologies, and feel free to take a look at our boots. Thanks.